The nation remembers her dead of this and other wars. At the tomb of the unknown soldier, Colonel Lowry, representing the president, places Mr. Truman's tribute to an honored hero of World War I. Solemn homage from the people, pausing reverently in the midst of war. At a national cemetery in Brooklyn, as at others throughout the country, pilgrimages to the flower-bedecked graves prove anew that a grateful nation will never forget those who died, that America might live. Troops are among the 25,000 who parade up New York's Riverside Drive. The banner that has been carried through the years by our heroes flies proudly. For the first time, no Civil War veteran is able to appear in this annual tribute. A hundred thousand take part in the impressive Marshall Salute, reviewed by Mayor LaGuardia and other dignitaries. The spirit of America's fighting men marches on. At Anzio, Italy, scene of one of our bloodiest landings, a group of rangers pays a visit to the fields where they fought. Captured by the Germans and freed by the Russians in Poland, they're on their way home. First, they visit the cemetery where many of their buddies lay buried for a last silent farewell. Signal Corps cameras show that they have remembered. Memorial Day will be every day for them, for you can't forget the man who died at your side. Let us remember the best Memorial Day tribute we can pay. Work harder for final victory. Ripped from stem to stern by the attacks of Jap suicide pilots off Okinawa, the destroyer USS Laffey comes home. Skippered by Commander Beckton, the fire-blackened ship is on display at Seattle. Visual evidence of the desperate need for more shipyard workers. The Laffey was struck with everything in the Jap book. In the savage attempt to finish her off, 22 suicide pilots roared over her. Seven bomb-loaded planes crashed on her decks. The final score was nine enemy planes shot down by the Laffey. But 32 of her brave men were dead or missing, and 60 were wounded. A Jap suicide boat, souvenir of the battle. 15,000 more workers are needed to repair ships damaged in the Pacific. Stay on the job until final victory. <laughs> Mrs. Truman makes her first public appearance since becoming the first lady at Washington Airport, where she is to christen two service transport planes as a part of the war loan drive. The planes were bought with Congressional Club bond sales. The First Lady gives the bottle a lusty swing, and with a little help, the plane is duly christened. The big ships are fitted for the evacuation of wounded. More bonds mean more planes. A byproduct of the war, air rescue is being developed into a fine art by members of the RCAF in Jasper National Park. Special helmets and masks are used by these volunteers who undergo 14 weeks of strenuous training for forest rescue work. Hand-picked pilots fly the dangerous terrain. Each candidate must make at least four timber jumps over densely wooded country and deliberately maneuver his chute so that he lands in trees. This boy knows the ropes. It's a bullseye. He then lowers himself from the tree with a rope attached to the chute's risers. He has hit a designated target from a height of 2,000 feet. A thorough course in first aid lasting six weeks is part of the training. And getting the wounded back to civilization is an intricate and sometimes dangerous business. The last lap to safety. War's techniques help open the wilderness, the silver lining in a dark cloud. Visiting the White House at President Truman's invitation, the regent and heir apparent to the throne of Iraq, Prince Abdul Ilah, 
will be in the United States for an extended stay. The press greets the 33-year-old royal visitor, a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. While here, the prince will inspect U.S. power and irrigation projects with an eye to his own country's needs, now that the clouds of war have cleared in Europe. General Mark Clark, commander of America's Fighting Fifth Army, arrives in Chicago, home of his boyhood, to receive a hearty welcome from the crowd at the airport. With Mayor Kelly, the hero of the bitter Italian campaign proceeds down Michigan Boulevard. General Clark's command pinned down and finally captured 25 German divisions after two years of fighting. Mrs. Clark bestows the warrior's reward. War Food Administrator Jones appeals for more farm labor. The need this year for town and city people to pitch in and help the farmer harvest and grow his crops is greater than ever before. Victory on one front does not mean there will be any less demand for food. In fact, the need will be even greater. I make this appeal to everyone in this audience. When the call comes in your community, answer it if you can. Men and women, boys and girls, all who can give a part-time of their vacation or all through the harvest should do so and should volunteer now before your county agricultural agent or your local farm employment office. The need is urgent. Your help on a farm will help make our victory complete. 